So we want to move on to the second part of the agenda this evening, which is uh, Glenda Lucas, and she is from GMAC, the GMAC people. Uh, Glenda is an account manager for the Americas of member and client schools, but in this role she conducts a lot of regular information sessions for candidates about the GMAC exam, the overview, the preparation, how it fits into the admissions process, and um, how it will help you or uh, get into a business school of your choice. Um, she's been with GMAC for 16 plus years, um, and before that she was with Ernst & Young. So without further ado, Glenda Lucas. Um, as mentioned, I'm Glenda Lucas and I'm with GMAC, the Graduate Management and Mission Council. There really is a company behind the test. I've been there for 16 years, um, and I spend a lot of time traveling around to all different kinds of schools, all the top schools uh, in the United States and Canada. And I've been doing this for a long, long time. And actually, the seats that you're sitting in today are part of one of the top global schools, top schools globally. So I just want to bring that to your attention that uh, Bentley is a, me a member of our organization and is considered a leader in the global industry. So who we are, we're a not-for-profit organization. Um, we have the GMAT, but we also offer lots of services for schools. We're a, a leader in our research on uh, candidate motivations and what they're, where they're applying, things like that. Um, we promote graduate management education uh, worldwide. Uh, so there really is, like I mentioned, a company behind um, the GMAT. And of course, we are the makers of the GMAT and the stewards of, of the assessment. So why the GMAT exam? So I've heard from students before, candidates before, that sometimes they feel like the GMAT is a barrier to their uh, admissions, to applying to school. Well, my goal for this evening is to try to lower your anxiety on the, on the exam uh, and try to make you understand that the GMAT is going to actually open doors for you. And I'm going to touch a little bit about the difference between the, uh, the GPA and the GMAT as we go on. We hope to give you a new perspective. Uh, the GMAT, like I said, can open doors for you, it can give you new opportunities, and it can make you stand ahead above everybody else in the crowd. Um, that the seriousness, that if you're serious about business school, the GMAT is the exam that you want to consider. The GMAT was actually uh, developed by business schools for business schools. Back in 1963, there were nine deans of schools in the United States that got together and they really needed an assessment to uh, determine how well uh, candidates are going to succeed in their programs. And they want you to succeed. It's a reflection of them, the school, and yourself. So business schools want you to do well in school. It's accepted by nearly 2,000 school, 2000 plus schools worldwide. Um, it's used in 100 di 110 different countries and it's offered in 600 different test centers. Lots of them are located right, right in the Boston area here. Nearly 9 out of 10 new MBA enrollments have taken the GMAT, so you're going to be in, in welcome hands. So the GMAT is a strong predictor of academic success. It's a CAT. Have you guys taken a CAT? A CAT's not like an SAT. A CAT is a computer adaptive test. And it's a, it's a better uh, testing experience for you. So. The way it predicts your academic success when you submit your application to a, a, a business school, they don't know anything about you. They don't know if you're going to succeed or if you're going to fail in their program. They want you to succeed. So they're going to open up the application. They're going to look at your GMAT score. And that is the one thing that they can compare across a level playing field amongst all of them. You all went to different undergrad schools. You all had different specialties. Um, you all come from different background, backgrounds. So that's the one part of your application that you can really control. And they're going to take that GMAT score and they're going to dig a little deeper. They're going to look at your uh, analytical writing score. They're going to look at your integrated reasoning score. And all of this is helping them focus uh, to see, to make sure that you're going to succeed in their program and help predict how successful you're going to be in their program. And they're going to look at your undergrad GPA. The GMAT is a way to compensate for things like that that you can't change in your past. They're going to look at your undergrad GPA, and again, it's going to help them sort of predict how, how successful you're going to be in their program. Then there's other stuff. 
and says, what GMAT is one part of the whole application process, just one part. They're going to look at other things that are going on with you. How, what's your motivation? What are your leadership skills? Uh, things like that. And then there's always the unknown. You, are you under financial, uh, financial burden? Things, a uh, couple kids running around the house, whatever. So there's lots of things to take into consideration to predict what you're, whether you'll be successful in their program. So I'm going to throw a few myths up here. Myth number one, I need a really high score to succeed uh, to be admitted to the program. What do you think? Yes? No? No. No, you don't. Don't ever let the GMAT keep you, restrict you from applying to a program you're interested in. The GMAT is one element of the entire application process. And we encourage all candidates to make sure your application is a reflection of you. Don't try to be something that you're not. Um, and the GMAT, you don't need that, you don't need a really high score to get into the program that you're interested in. Always apply to where you want to apply. Um, as I mentioned, it's part of a whole. Uh, what are your leadership skills? What are your, uh, your job skills background? Uh, your extra extracurricular activities. It's, if, if I'm going to pound one thing home with you tonight, the GMAT is one part of the entire application. The value of the GMAT, it helps you stand out in a crowd, as I mentioned, it keeps everybody on a level playing field. It helps you uh, compensate with, for undergrad GPA or maybe your lack of work experience, uh, things like that. For schools, it's certainly a way for them to assess how successful you're going to be uh, in your program and everybody wants to be a winner here. You guys want to be successful in school. Schools want to uh, admit successful applicants and they want you to be successful in their program as a reflection of their, uh, of their school. So the GMAT exam is really, it's a CAD and it's really tailored for you. So it starts with an item with middle um, difficulty. Uh, if you get a question wrong, your next question may be a little easier. If you get a question right, your next question um, may be a little difficult. You can't, more, more difficult. You can't skip uh, forward and you can't go back. You have to complete all of the questions so they'll be considered wrong. Uh, every item counts in scoring. One question isn't more important than the other one. Um, so for the a computer adaptive test is certainly more accurate, it's more efficient, and it's a better testing experience, as I mentioned, for all of you. So this is going to show you a little bit how it works, and it also brings up my myth number two. Only the first ten can questions count. Did you guys know that? I'm glad you didn't, because it's not true. Every question on the exam counts. As I mentioned, when you first come in, your first question, if you get it wrong, your next one may be a little easier. Now you're all freaking out. Maybe, you, maybe you're stressed because you couldn't find a place to park. Uh, maybe you start settling down a little bit, and then you start getting your questions correct until it finds where your level of competency is, and it will average out to what your ability is. Oops, sorry. So that's how the, a cat works. Now the only other thing I would add to that is if you get a question wrong and the next question is easier, keep in mind that it might be a content change and maybe you're better at the, at the new content and that's why it seems easier to you. So uh, that's just something to keep in mind if you do get a question wrong. Myth number three, uh, I just talked about. If it's an easier question, it could be uh, a wrong answer, not necessarily. It's a computer adaptive test. So let's go ahead and break down what the exam looks like. So there's four different parts of the exam. Uh, the analytical writing is the first section. Um, it's one question. You get a score between uh, zero and six, and it takes you 30 minutes. The second part of the exam is integrated reasoning. This is our new section of the exam. It's been around for about three or four years now. And integrated reasoning is the ability uh, to take information from lots of different places, like you would do at work, spreadsheets, emails, articles, things like that, and put that information together to, to, to make your argument. Uh, there's 12 questions. 
scores between one and eight, and that's gonna take you another 30 minutes. And then we have the all important optional break. And please don't make it optional. Make sure you take this eight minute break. And how some psychometrician came up with eight minutes, I have no idea, but that's supposedly the magic number. And I also would encourage you to get a feeling of what eight minutes feels like. It seems pretty simple. Not necessarily. It may go faster than you think. It may drag on. So when you're studying for the exam, give yourself a timed eight minute break so you know what that feels like. When you come back from that first break, you're gonna go right into the quant section. That is a 75 minute section. Um, there are 37 questions and you'll get a score between zero and 60. And then we're gonna give you another optional eight minute break. Again, please don't make it optional. You're gonna end up with the verbal reasoning section. Uh, there's 41 questions. It's, uh, you're going to get a score between 0 and 60. So the whole thing's going to take you about four hours. And you're going to get a score somewhere between 200 and 800. And I've been told if you sign your name, you're going to get a 200. Yay. Um, studying for the GMAT, I tell candidates that it's their, your first business class, business school class. Everything you study for on the GMAT is what you'll be doing in grad school. So when you're studying for the analytical re uh, writing uh, section, for instance, you're going to be analyzing an argument. That's exactly what you're going to do in business school. Analyze arguments. Uh, take an informed position. And the same with the integrated reasoning. When you're studying for the GMAT, you'll be using that skill in business school. So studying for the GMAT is your first business school class. So let's take a look at some of the questions. So this is an analytical, um, analytical writing question. So you'll be given a paragraph. You don't have to take time tonight to read what this paragraph is because I'm not <coughs> asking you to solve this question. But you'll be given a paragraph to read and then you're going to be given instructions of what they want you to do in this section. So I think what's really important here, I don't know if we have a, no we don't. If you look at the first two sentence, sentences on your instructions, they're telling you exactly what you have to do. Read the paragraph and discuss how well reasoned this argument is. You'll need to consider what questionable assumptions underlie the thinking. So that's the, exactly what you're supposed to do in the writing, in the answering of this uh, question. Your English and your punctuation is not scored here, so don't worry about that. I would advise you don't write a book. Write what you need to. Make sure you have time to go back and reread it. Uh, and don't worry about your grammar um, or your punctuation. So that's an analytical writing assessment question. <clears throat> Integrated reasoning, as I mentioned, it's taking information from lots of different places and putting it together to come up with your argument. Uh, this is an example of, an, of uh, integrated reasoning, multi-source reasoning. One thing I do want to point out here is you see this little calculator button up there, sort of on the top, light blue? This is the only section of the test you can, that you have a calculator available to you. So this isn't a fancy dancy calculator like probably all of you have with all the bells and whistles. This is the most simple calculator you can find. So my advice to you is when you're studying for the GMAT, buy yourself a $1.50, $2 calculator and use that to help you study for the GMAT. Because you're going to freak out if you get there and you don't have all your bells and, and whistles on your uh, normal calculator that you use. Again, integrated reasoning, this is a table analysis. Um, as you can see, it's, it's an Excel, spread, Excel spreadsheet columns like that you can sort uh, in different ways and come up with your uh, answers. They're true and false answers, by the way. And then integrated reason also has a graphic interpretation. What are, what are you seeing here? What do you think? And can you answer these questions? These are actually drop down. Uh, answers that you select. So it's not that difficult. Um, 
The math that you, use, that you need to use uh, for the GMAT is 10th grade math. It's not advanced, advanced math at all. So if you guys have been out of school for a while and you're, even you're, you know, you're unfamiliar with your, the math that you learned in high school, what you might want to do is take yourself, uh, get yourself a free high school re math review class that you can find online somewhere to help you prepare for the GMAT. If, you're, you know, if you've been out of school for a while and you're a little rusty, Yeah. So my question is, is a calculator really necessary? Are we going to be dealing with like, huge numbers where you need to like do a long division kind of deal, or is it just basic small? I think it depends on the person. Whether it's net for me, it would be totally necessary. But regardless of what I'm doing, I want a simple little calculator to make sure I'm correct. Um, it's it's adding, adding uh, subtracting, multiplying, dividing. Uh, Two-part table analysis, again, um, question will involve two components for a solution and the, and the possible answers will be in a table format. Okay, the quantitative reasoning section is it, I'm going to give you another myth, advanced math skills are just required. I just told you, no, it's a 10th grade level of math is required, basic algebra. It's not, so it's not, it's not about your math skills, it's how you can apply what you what your math skills are and come up with some reasoning behind it. Does this make sense based on your, your basic math skills that you do have? This is one of my favorite ones. The price of lunch for 15 people was $207, including a 15% gratuity. What is the average price per food per person excluding gratuity? So how do you back into the answer to this question? Um, the answer is 12, but it kind of reminds me of that I'm sure you guys had in high school or junior high. Train A leaves Los Angeles at this time traveling this speed and train B leaves New York. Same sort of reasoning abilities involved in figuring out a question like this. Oh, this is a good one. This is um, data sufficiency. So this is a certain class, one student is to be selected at random to read. What is the probability that that student will be a boy? And then it gives you two little facts here. Two-thirds of the students in the class were boys. Ten of the students in the class were girls. So what's important about this question are statements A through E here. A through E are exactly the same in every one of the data sufficiency questions. So what I'd like you to do is become very familiar with these answers so you don't have to spend a lot of time after you've read the problem and the, salute and the uh, uh, questions to figure out which one, you know, to have to read each one of these statements and make sure they make sense in your mind. Become familiar with the answers so you know quickly which one you're going to select. Verbal reasoning, you know, you're given a couple paragraphs to read and A, B, C, D, E um, answers one of those to select. You've, you've done this since you were in junior high school. <coughs> Again, critical reasoning gives you a paragraph to read. Which of the following is true would point to a possible flaw in the city's plan. So it's comprehension. You're reading your thinking, it's your critical reasoning ability to solve, to come up with uh, uh, an opinion on this particular question. Yeah, I like this one too. This is uh, sentence correction. So you got to be able to look at the sentence here and then it's ask you, is which kept the brain from getting too hot? And then, and then you have some suggestions here. So what's interesting about this question is if you are a um, a non-native English speaker, you probably are going to do better on this section than a native English speaker. Because a native English speaker, we, we, we speak what sounds good to us. Or a non-native English speaker probably has better um, grammar than us native speakers. The answer to this one is that keeps. So just keep that in mind again. One thing to consider, if, if, especially if you've been out of school for out of high, even high school or undergrad for a while, free online high school brush up on your English. So 
to the GMAT. Um, have you guys been to MBA.com to register? You guys visited <coughs> MBA.com? Oh my gosh, you have to go to MBA.com. MBA.com or GMAT.com. You can get to it in either uh, URL. It's filled with tons of, of information for you guys. Um, you can compa find and compare schools. You can, it have, gives you a list of events per city, per zip code that are coming up. Lots of advice from other uh, people that are alumni of, of Finnish school, people that are already in school. Advice from schools themselves, professionals in schools, financial uh, advice, a guide to the rankings. I mean, you're missing a lot if you don't go there. But one of the big, and, and this is where you register for the test, too. And when you register for the test, you can, um, you can search by zip code, so you know uh, what testing center you want to go to to take the test. Um, so you, I really, really encourage you to <laughs> check it out. Well, one of the most important things is there's t free GMAT prep that's available to you on MBA.com. There's two full-length GMAT tests that can be downloaded for you to, to practice studying. They're free. They're free. Go there, please. So when you register for the test, there's a couple things that I want to bring to your attention. It's going to cost you 250 bucks. Um, your test is good for five years. If you have anybody in the crowd that wants to take the test and go out and get some more work experience, stick it in your back pocket. Uh, then you can apply to school because it's good, good for five years. You'll have, you can send the, that te your test score to five different programs. So have an idea of where you want to send your test uh, as you, when you take the test. You can retest every 16 days if you're just crazy enough to want to retest every 16 days. Um, but you can only uh, test up to five times in a year. Um, some things that you expect on testing day at the test center. Uh, so when you arrive, they're going to want a, a picture ID, a government issued ID. Uh, they're going to take your picture, digital picture. Um, you're going to sign in, and then you're going to get your palm vein scanned. This is a high test, high security test, and everybody, your veins in your palm are uh, more um, identifying than fingerprints, or even the eye, the whole eye thing. Everybody's veins in their in their palm are different, so you get that you get that um, taken when you're the test center. Score preview is something new that we've added within the last year to the test. Um, when you complete the assessment, you're going to get your unofficial score right in front of you. And so it gives you an opportunity if you want to cancel that or if you want to keep it. You get to preview what your score is before you decide what you want to do. To cancel your score, yeah? Why would you cancel your score? <clears throat> you want to cancel your score, maybe you weren't prepared, maybe you got sick. Can somebody see those scores? Unless no one will ever see that score. You are the only one that will know what that's for. So why would you cancel it? You don't want it. You don't want to submit it to schools. If you don't cancel it, you're gonna, it's going to be sent to schools. Oh, okay. So if you've already said that you want to send them to schools. So yeah. You'll select the schools you want to send your score to before you see your test. And so uh, your test score. So after you see your test score, you can decide whether you want to cancel it or not. Can you okay. select the schools after you take the test? No. Now, well, you can if you want to pay extra money. Okay, so if somebody wants to do a set put in your back pocket and eventually apply? Yeah, then it's going to cost you to send those scores. Yeah. Um, so if you take the exam multiple times, um, does your highest score count, or are you going to have to just cancel anything lower than whatever you previously got? If you take, this, if you take the test and you've already sent those <coughs> that score to schools, and then you take it again and you get a higher test and you send a new score to that school, they're going to see both, both of the scores that you sent, which could be a good thing. You know, it shows that you have initiative, you didn't feel like you did well enough, and you got, now you have a higher score. But if you cancel it, they're not going to see so it. So if you score lower, then it makes sense to cancel it so that they don't if you, see it. You know, if it's not, uh, I think I have a slide coming up, but I'll just say this here. Have an idea of what you want your score range to be before testing day. 
have an idea of the of the programs that you are thinking about applying to? What's what's their range? What's their average GMAT range? Again, like I said earlier, that I would encourage you to continue to apply to that school if if this is a good score for you. If you think this is this is as good as I'm, it's going to get, and you're not in that range that the school has uh, uh, stated on their website, for instance, you know, by all means, go ahead and apply. But have a, in your mind before you see your score: is this is this where I think I should be? <coughs> so you know where the cancel is. Um, how much does it cost to send it out there? The fact it's uh, twenty <coughs> twenty five dollars, twenty four ninety nine per school test. Yeah, per score. Per score, so send it to multiple ones? You, you pay that per multiple one. That's why you should know where you want to apply before you get there. Yeah. Uh, so say that you cancel your score and then you think you're going to do better next time, but you actually want to do it worse. You guys keep the first score on file and then you guys resend that score that was canceled, but it was just better than the second one? Yeah. You can have your score reinstated uh, for five years. That's four four years and eleven months. Yeah. So again, not, so you're not canceling the score. You're canceling the seven. You're for five years, and then it's kaput. Yeah. No, but no one knows what that what that score is except you. So unless you say yes, please send this to a school, they're not going to know. Yeah. So if you did that on the first. One, you cancel it and get better on the second one. They'll only see the second one. They won't even know about the first one. Yep, that's okay. correct. Yeah, it used to be the other way around. It used to be schools would see everything that you had. They'd see several scores for you with a C by it. And they, actually, schools want that. They want to see how you're doing, how you're improving, what's going on with you. But all of you throughout the world came to us and said, hey, this is too much pressure. I don't want schools to know what I've done. And so when you cancel a score now, they don't have any idea. Is it like different from like the SAT where you take like your best scores from each section, so they only take it from the one sitting? Yeah, no, it's the total total test. That's what your score is. Is that what you're asking me? The best score per section if you sat for more than yeah. one time? Yeah, no. So if you don't know when you're going to be applying, and you take the test, put the score in your back pocket. Does that just cost extra money to not send it out to schools immediately after? Okay. Yes. Uh, this just talks about some of the prices to have your score reinstated and canceled for free. Um, you have 72 answers with, with 72 hours after you complete the exam. Um, if you canceled it, uh, to cancel it online. Uh, convenience of $50 if you want to reinstate your score, and et cetera, et cetera. On hand score report is kind of cool. It sits on top of the GMAT prep, which is free, which all of you guys are going to go register on MBA.com now and get this free GMAT prep, right? Yes, yes. Um, and the hand score report sits on top of that. It's an analysis that can show you, you know, your timing, or you, how much time you're spending on each question, um, how you rank with everybody else that has taken this particular section of the score. I'm, I'm 37th in the world on this section. I'm not in the 90th percentile. I've also seen students get this and take it to admissions officers and talk to them about it. You know, hey, I see my, you know, this is just a practice score, but I'm a little low in this area, and this is what I'm doing to help improve that score. The more communication you can have with your admissions uh, officers for the schools you want to apply to, the better off you are. This is just something else to consider um, when you're um, preparing for the test. It just shows you what I was just talking about. This one's, for instance, your mean time. You're spending 1.71 seconds per question. And it is important to pace yourself when you're studying. You know, on those free downloads, you have two tests per download. So I would take the first one to see how well you did to where you need to focus your, your time and, and studying going, going forward. But also take a look at how long it took you to get through this. Did you finish it? Because you need to pace yourself as you go through these questions. Because, because remember my myth, every question counts. If you don't answer it, it's going to be wrong. I thought this was just interesting to show you the uh, median number of prep time for, to take the GMAT. Um, obviously, the more you study, the better off you're going to be, the higher your score is going to be. 
but I also thought it was interesting per country, if you look at Asia Pacific, their culture, they take testing very seriously. They spend lots of time studying for the test. In the United States, eh, not so much. Do you have corresponding averages with the regions? You what? Do you have corresponding averages with the regions? Gosh, you're really asking me these questions, aren't you? I have no idea. I'm, I'm sure we do. Like I'm sure we do. I just don't have it on this well, slide. Take the and first part. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like, if by correlation, all people in Asia should have 700 or greater. Well, they, I can tell you that they do score a little higher. Yeah. Uh, study material, as I mentioned, the free GMAT prep, um, MBA.com. Uh, one little trick I wanted to tell you about that, um, the free mat, GMAT prep. So each one of the downloads, you have two full-length tests. So you really have four full-length tests to study from for free. On this, and I, this, I, know, I hope you remember this because it's kind of cool. The very last page, I don't have a picture of it, but the very last screenshot of the free GMAT prep <laughs> I don't know if you're going to remember this or not. Scroll down to the bottom and there's this wee little checkbox. And if you check that box, you can reset the whole thing and take it again for free. Now the only thing is, is that you may get a repeat question. But what a great way to study. You can check that box as many times as you want to. You're going to get more and more repeat questions, but still awesome questions for you to answer online and the same kind of experience going on. That just talks about what you guys are all going to do. Uh, MBA.com again, please go and register for on MBA.com. One thing you can do on MBA.com also is you can opt into something that's called GMASS, G-M-A-S-S, -S, that's a graduate management um, student search service. So what you're doing is you're telling schools, hey, I do want you to communicate with me. Schools go in on the other line and they get, they get lists of names so they know uh, who, who they can help, uh, try to recruit to their program. So I'd encourage you to do that if you want schools to contact you. And that's it.